Joining me now to discuss this and much more is North Carolina Attorney General Josh Stein. Uh, Mr. Attorney General, thank you so much for your time. I think it is safe to say all eyes will be on North Carolina. These are two critical uh, cases. Talk to, me a bit, talk to me a little bit uh, about that. Um, you know, what the impact of these decisions not only could mean for the people of North Carolina, but for the rest of us across the country as the U.S. Supreme Court prepares a ruling on Moore versus Harper. I'm a pleasure to be with you. You know, you, you flashed a, front, a picture of the front of the Supreme Court building, which says equal justice under law. And that's because the law is supposed to be impartial. And the concern about what the North Carolina Supreme Court did is just as you noted, that in one day they issued an order to rehear two cases, which they had only done twice in the previous 30 years. And whenever cases get reheard by an appellate court, it's almost always because of one of two things. Either there was a change in the facts or there had been a change in the law that really implicated the reasoning, the rationale of the original decision. These decisions were just rendered by the North Carolina Supreme Court two months ago, and nothing has changed other than the partisan composition of the bench. It went from majority Democrat to majority Republican after the last elections. And frankly, this is troubling. Let me ask you about what happened on Thursday as well, sir. Um, the state Supreme Court, they held a hearing on whether people should have the right to vote while on probation or parole. Last year, a superior court in Wake County, as I understand it, restored their voting rights in what was a landmark ruling. Now, with this new Republican majority on the bench, we could see the, the rolling back of those rights again. Am, am I understanding that correctly? And what are your thoughts on how this is unfolded? Yeah, basically, my, my philosophy is very simple. It's that if, if you're an American citizen, we should make voting as easy and safe and secure as possible. We should not be putting up barriers to people's participation. And, and as a matter of policy, in this case, I believe that if you are in the community living, you're on probation and parole and you're a citizen, you should be able to vote. And, and that's the question that the North Carolina Supreme Court has to determine. As attorney general, um, what steps can and, and should you be taking um, or your office be taking to protect voting rights in North Carolina as they increasingly come under attack? Yeah, and this is not new. I mean, unfortunately, this has been going on for years. Of course, we have a long, sordid, sad Jim Crow history of attacks on voting rights. But as recently as a decade ago, the Republican legislature passed what was called a monster anti-voter law. The Fourth Circuit struck that law down saying it targeted African-Americans with, quote, almost surgical precision. Well, the previous governor, Pat McCrory, petitioned the U.S. Supreme Court to reinstate that law. As the North Carolina Attorney General, I withdrew that petition successfully because I believe the state should be about protecting people's right to vote, not restricting it. So I believe fundamentally that we all have a right to vote and to vote in fair districts. And that's why partisan gerrymandering is so dangerous. You know, I, I filed a brief last year with the North Carolina Supreme Court arguing that partisan gerrymandering violates our state constitution's declared rights to free elections, free speech, free association, and equal protection. And the court agreed with that argument, struck down the maps that the General Assembly had enacted and ordered them to draw new ones. And they worked. And you know how I know they worked is because our congressional delegation that the voters sent to Washington was seven Democrats and seven Republicans. We are the most 50-50 state in the entire country. And the Republicans wanted to have a delegation that was 10 uh, Republicans, four Democrats, or 11 Republicans, wow. three Democrats. That's just not the way it's supposed to be. Let me get your thoughts, if I can, on state politics for a moment. You know, we, we know that Republicans still hold the North uh, Carolina. Um, they still have a stronghold on North Carolina politics, I should say, even though Democrats won uh, the governor's race. Um, Politico pointed out it, it didn't turn out to be, I think, what some had hoped for, that North Carolina would become a toss up state after President Obama won it in 2008. What do you think the Democratic strategy should be for your state to, to increase um, the Democrats' chances in, in making North Carolina a uh, purple state, if not a toss-up state? Well, I, I totally disagree with your thesis. We are an absolute toss-up state. Uh, only one time in the last four presidential elections has a candidate crossed the 50 percent threshold. That was Romney in 2012 with 50.4 percent. 
Trump never crossed 50 percent, and Obama didn't when he won in 2008. No other state has had that narrow of a margin. And in 2020, in 2020, President Biden lost North Carolina by just over one point. It was the state he lost most narrowly. So we are absolutely in play for the presidential race in 2024. And then as it relates to state races, you know, I won two times in 16 and 20, even though Trump won both times, as did our governor, uh, Roy Cooper. So Democrats have proven that they can win statewide in North Carolina, and we are absolutely in play in the presidential in 2024. And that is exactly why we invite you on the show, so you can correct our uh, incorrect assessments when we make them. I certainly appreciate that. Let me ask you, if I can, though, Mr. Stein, um, about your yes. run for uh, governor in 2024. What would you hope to achieve in your state should you win? How would you carry on the legacy of uh, the current Democratic governor, as you mentioned, Mr. Roy Cooper? For me, governing is frankly pretty simple. It's about having an economy that works for everybody, that's built from the middle out, not serving those who are in the, in the well-to-do category, make sure that economic opportunity is really broadly distributed across our state, including small town North Carolina, having strong public schools where our kids learn so that when they're ready to go to college or start their career, they can succeed, having a health care system where everybody can get it no matter where they live or how much money they earn, neighborhoods that are safe so kids can go play outside after school and parents don't have to worry, uh, retirement with economic security. It's really very basic. And these are things that the state of North Carolina can do to help the people of North Carolina. I I've proven as attorney general that I am a fighter and I fought for them to take on big pharma on the opioid case, to tackle the backlog of untested sexual assault kits, to go after polluters poisoning drinking water. So those are fights I've taken, and I will continue to fight for the people as their governor. North Carolina Attorney General, Mr. Josh Stein, sir, thank you so much. I greatly appreciate your time. Thank you for joining us. Thanks, Simon.